Google announces Titan, a Bluetooth-enabled U2F device? Okay. Spectre grew up and now works remotely, and 23andMe starts selling data to Big Pharma. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morse, and this is ThreatWire for July 31st, 2018, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Our Patreon is over at patreon.com slash threatwire, and that is always the best way to support the show and will help us reach our next goal. So if you want access to exclusives, including our brand new Discord server, make sure to check out the Patreon link in the show notes below. And special thanks to our newest patrons, including Forrest Omar Thepchaya, Cameron, Kyle, James, Daniel, John, and Christopher. And now, on to the news. And first off, it's all about Google. So about a week ago, Google announced that out of their 85,000 employees, none of them had been fished or hacked since they implemented physical security keys as the default for each employee to use. Physical hardware token keys use multi-factor authentication to allow a user to log into an account. They connect to your laptop, your desktop, Top, your tablet, or your phone via USB, Bluetooth, or NFC to authenticate your login process. This creates a second factor of verification, proving that you not only have your username and your password, but also a physical key in your possession. So if an attacker steals your password, they still cannot get into your account because they don't have that hardware token. This protocol is different than two-factor authentication apps or codes that are sent to your phone, which can be intercepted by an attacker if transit is used incorrectly, or they could be stolen with a cloned SIM card. And that's a serious problem. Physical keys are more secure due to this reason. Now, this universal second factor is an open standard protocol that allows these security keys to work. And two different companies started this whole trend and this whole protocol, Google and Yubico. Now, they were joined by a whole bunch of other companies, which also chose to adopt the standard for security keys called the FIDO Alliance. Now, Google in particular kept their employees secure with an early version of a new security key that they were working on, and this is called the Titan Security Key. Now, Google revealed the Titan Security Key at their Google Cloud Next conference in San Francisco last week, launching a USB and a Bluetooth version for purchase together for 50 bucks or separately for 20 bucks and 25 bucks, respectively. They are going to be available to Google Cloud customers first, and then they'll be released to the public via the Google Store. Google says that this new security key has firmware built in to verify its integrity whenever you use it with a store that accepts U2F. Now, how does the key differ from Yubico's YubiKey? Well, YubiKeys offer USB-A, USB-C, and NFC capability, and they come in various sizes and price ranges, but they do not offer a Bluetooth option. How strange. Now, in a blog by the CEO of Yubico, the company explains that a Bluetooth YubiKey model would not meet their standards for security, usability, and durability due to the need for batteries and poor pairing experiences, plus less security than USB or NFC. And with the recent Bluetooth flaw that affected secure, simple pairing and low energy secure connections, and that is exactly what Titan uses, it comes with no surprise that Bluetooth should be seen as vulnerable. Now, Google claims that they want to offer more options to consumers. They do not want to compete with Yubico, and they have been advocating for the use of security keys for honestly quite some time. They also require security keys for their advanced protection program if you are part of that program. Now, you can still use a YubiKey with Google account, so you don't necessarily have to buy a new Titan that is not required, and Google says that only 10% of its users are currently using 2FA of any kind in Gmail, including applications or SMS codes. So I have a serious question for you. Are you using a physical hardware security key like a YubiKey, or do you want to purchase a Titan? If not, why not? Do you use two-factor authentication on your phone instead? Let me know in the comments below. From Desi Matrix on Patreon, so far Spectre has been a localized attack, which requires a user to download and run malware on their machine for it to work. This CPU attack hit the news earlier this year alongside Meltdown, which caused waves for CPU manufacturers. Spectre in particular was really bad because there's not a good way to fix it unless a new generation of CPUs were manufactured or the manufacturer releases firmware to patch it. So a few days ago, as of time of recording, four scientists from the Graz 
Graz University of Technology in Austria released a paper called NetSpecter Read Arbitrary Memory Over Network. In this paper, the scientists explain how speculative execution works on machines and why Spectre was always considered a locally executed attack. But they were able to develop a new attack platform based on it called NetSpecter, which can be used as a remote variant using an evict and reload cache attack over a network, but also using a high performance AVX based covert channel attack platform. It worked for both machines on a LAN as well as VMs in a Google Cloud. Now the attack works very, very slowly with the evict and reload cache attack over a network connection that specifically targets data stored on the CPU's cache, exfiltrating at a measly 15 bits per hour. That would take a very long time. But the attack based on targeting data on the CPU's AVX2 module, which by the way is only on Intel CPUs, exfiltrated at 60 bits per hour. That is still incredibly slow. So in theory, this could be ramped up over time with new ways of exfiltrating data off of a CPU, but at the moment it is way too slow to be useful for an attacker. With that said though, it's still a vulnerability. For example, leaking a memory address only took two hours in their testing. And since this attack is based on Spectre, you can protect your machines in much the same way. Firmware upgrades to CPUs can help and are recommended. From Joel on Patreon and chosen as the Patreon story pick this week is the 23andMe scandal. Now, as many of you may have already imagined, giving your DNA to data companies is not the most secure thing that you can do in 2018. I mean, think about it. You are voluntarily paying a company to have your DNA on file. That's a little bit creepy. Now, as reported in a recent episode of ThreatWire, these genetic databases are already being successfully used by law enforcement to track down criminals and verify suspects, like the infamous Golden State Killer. This past Wednesday, it was announced that 23andMe has a partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, or GSK. GSK is a British pharmaceutical company that is the ninth largest in the world right now. 23andMe gave GSK access to the genomes of 5 million customers. That means that the the genetic information of 5 million customers has been stored and analyzed by a pharmaceutical company which can manipulate the market of pharma drugs and is known for using AI technology in their development of new medicines. GSK says that the information will help them to identify and specifically engineer new medicines for diseases. Now, the two leading scientists, Hal Barron and Richard Scheller, sealed this deal for $300 million for four years of access to the database. 23andMe is one of the world's largest private genetic database services, and they reportedly are using the information to innovate new medicines and cures. 23andMe gathers genetic information from customers by collecting little samples of saliva, and a year ago, this information was determined to be accurate enough to sell customer reports about whether or not they had risks of developing certain diseases by the FDA. According to the CEO of the company, Ann Wojcicki, there is a way for customers to opt out of having their information sold to the pharmaceutical company, and yet 80% of the users opted into the use of their genetic info. This possible opt-out situation is very, very reminiscent of the Facebook data trading scandal that has been flooding the news for months. And it is a question of whether or not people are even made aware of this activity and what it could entail and how it could affect them. As we know, we currently live in a time where TLDR is the attitude that most of the world's fast-paced consumers treat towards privacy policies and towards terms of service. The use of this information could really help with medical innovation. For example, in 2015, 23andMe Therapeutics was launched with the specific mission of creating innovative medicines and cures. Right now, this information is being used in the current research of possible cures for Parkinson's disease, which I think is pretty cool. Now, the CEO of 23andMe has promoted this merger as an opportunity for customers to be more involved in the creation of medical advances for specific human diseases by paying to donate their DNA. And yet, there are various issues that come along with this sort of data collection and usage. For starters, the information sold to the pharmaceutical company, which is used to develop medicines for people, is then sold back to the sick at an extremely high price, which in turn are much more beneficial to 23andMe as well as GSK at the cost of the consumer and the public. 
And technically, the customers of 23andMe are offering priceless resources to GSK Medical Development and will not see any kind of return on their information. They should get paid too. Big pharma companies have and will create life-saving drugs inaccessibly expensive in order to increase their bottom line. In many ways, this means that 23andMe customers will be charged twice for any medicines that are created by this $300 million deal, which utilizes their genetic information for research. Now, as stated by the motherboard, quote, the first time they paid for the DNA sequencing service, the second time they pay for the medicine that it helps create. A more equitable solution, according to Peter Pitts, the president of the Center for Medicine in the Public Interest, would be to pay 23andMe customers for their genetic data when it is used in research. Although customers can withdraw, the company stated that any research involving your data that has already been performed or published prior to our receipt of your request will not be reversed, undone, or withdrawn. Yet, if they have not yet used the information of customers which opted out, they will throw out the saliva and not use it for further research. All of that being said, both companies have stated that the data security is extremely important to them and they have very strict security practices in all transferring and use of data and that they use encryption at all times. But of course, we have heard companies say that before and then they have huge security breaches. So can we absolutely trust them? Probably not. Patrons, make sure to share your favorite security stories in the community tab or on Discord. And every Friday, I will pick three or more top stories for a voting poll that patrons can vote on to be included in next week's show. Patrons also get access to a downloadable audio version of the show, first looks at show topics, polls, discussions just for patrons, behind the scene photos, and now that Discord server just for patrons at $2 per month and up. Make sure to join now and get access to all of these and help support the show. And by the way, in our Discord, we just created a brand new channel just for people that are looking to hire or are looking for jobs. So hopefully we can get some mutual acquaintances hiring each other in there. That's super exciting. So I'm very excited to see if anything comes of that channel. Our next milestone goal gets you access to a live video video Q&A just for patrons at all levels and gets us closer to doing a second episode each and every week. And also a big thanks, of course, to our Hush Puppy Perk level patrons for sending in their adorable fur baby photos. I love them. Keep them coming. Send me some new ones. I can't wait to see them. Hit that subscribe button or share this episode on your favorite social media page as well. And with that, I am Shannon Morse and I will see you on the internet. Thank <laughs> you.